A huge thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hi everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about a particular rule that electric fields have to follow that I think is very cool and it tells us a lot about them. We'll also start from scratch by understanding the concept of electric fields in a hopefully simple way. So if you enjoy this video then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. First things first, let's talk about what an electric field is very quickly. One way to think about an electric field is as something generated by electrically charged objects or particles. For example, we know that everything is made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of smaller charged particles, like electrons. Electrons are negatively charged, so produce an electric field that looks a bit like this. All this is representing is what would happen to a small positive charge if we were to put it at different points in the field. Let's say we placed a small positive charge here. The field lines that we've drawn show that the negative charge will exert a force in this direction. And as the positive charge moves closer to the negative one, the force on it gets stronger. This sort of adds up with what we know about charges, right? Opposite charges attract, and when they're closer together, they attract very strongly. We can also consider what would happen when a positive charge is producing an electric field. But the main idea is that an electric field shows us what happens to a small positive charge placed near the source of the field. Or at least that's one thing the electric field does. It's one way of thinking about electric fields. For more information about these kinds of fields, check out this video up here. There is one important thing I want to note about electric fields. We've seen this already, but not stated this outright. Electric fields are vector fields, meaning they can be thought of as a vector assigned to every point in space. The size shows how strong an electric force would be if a positive charge was placed at that point, and the direction shows what direction the force would act in. But then, if electric fields are vector fields, then maybe we can represent them with a different kind of vector notation. At every point in space, we can instead state the three components of each vector from the previous diagram. So for example, at this point, the vector is big and has these x, y, and z components, whereas at this point, the x, y, and z components are smaller, because the electric field vector overall is smaller as well. Now, here's the thing. In many cases, we can represent the entire electric field with one simple vector that helps us calculate the vector field at every point, rather than having to write out the vector at every point in space. For example, we might have an electric field that looks like this x, y, 0. All this is saying is that the component of the vector field in the z direction is 0 at every point, the component of the field in the x direction is equal to the x coordinate at that point, and the same is true for y. Now note that this x and y doesn't mean the x and y component. That information is implied by where we write the formula. Anything written here is the x component of the field, anything written here is the y component, and anything written here is the z component. It's just that the x component, or the size of the electric field that points along the x direction, can depend on the x coordinate of whatever point in space we happen to be considering. All this is telling us is that when x is small, so when we are further to the left, the electric field pointing in the x direction is weak. And as we move further right, for larger values of x, the electric field pointing this way gets stronger. Now, this might seem slightly confusing, but it's important we are clear about this, and here's why. Some fields might even behave like this. The component of the electric field in a particular direction actually depends on one of the other coordinates. In this particular case, we've got y, 0, 0. This means that at x is equal to 5, the field pointing this way is y units strong. We're choosing x is equal to 5 just as a random x coordinate, doesn't really matter. But the idea is that the field is weak here and strong here. Again, this y is not representing the y component of the field, but rather the y coordinate of the point we're studying. The component is actually the x component, the, the stuff pointing in the x direction. All of this is going to become important in a second, but it's worth noting that the examples of fields that we've just looked at are not necessarily realistic fields. I just made them up to clarify the mathematics a little bit. 
So let's now move on to the special rule for electric fields that we're meant to be looking at. To do this, I want to quickly mention one of Maxwell's equations. This thing here tells us one of the ways in which electric fields must behave, assuming Maxwell's equations are correct, of course. We'll use this equation to get our special rule, which applies in some very interesting circumstances, but first, let's briefly understand what the equation is telling us. Now, if you're looking for a full discussion, a full detailed discussion, then please check out this video up here. Let's start on the right hand side of this equation because it's a bit easier to discuss. Firstly, B represents a magnetic field, the overall magnetic field that is present in any system that we happen to be studying. So if we have a system where there are electric and magnetic fields, then we plug the magnetic field in here and the electric field in here. Now, the right hand side of our equation specifically looks at how quickly the magnetic field changes over time. That's all this is saying, the rate of change of magnetic field with respect to time. And actually, we want negative this change because that's how this law works in our universe. Now, we're going to be studying systems where either there is no magnetic field, or if there is one, it is constant and does not change with time. In other words, if we ask the question, how quickly does the magnetic field change in our system? The answer is zero. This reduces our equation down to the curl of E is equal to zero, at which point we can ask, what does the curl of E actually mean? Well, this operator curl takes a vector field like the electric field and returns another vector field, which is a measure of how rotational the field is. So that's a kind of hand wavy definition. I discuss it in much more detail in this video up here about the Nabla operator. For our purposes though, all we care about is that the curl of the electric field has this mathematical form. These terms look at how quickly components of the electric field change in a particular direction. So this time not changing over time, but rather how quickly they change in a particular direction. For example, DEY by DZ looks at how quickly the Y pointing component of the electric field changes as a function of Z. And we're keeping X and Y constant here. Let's say, for example, this is the Y component of the electric field we happen to be studying. If we plot that on a graph against Z, we see that it changes quite quickly as we move along Z from small values of Z to large values of Z. Whereas for a field that has this Y component, it changes very slowly over Z. DEY by DZ has a small value. And for a component like this, it doesn't depend on Z at all. So it doesn't matter where along Z we are, the Y pointing component is always the same. Hence DEY by DZ here is equal to zero. All this derivative is doing is checking how this particular component depends on this particular variable. And because we have partial derivatives, once again, this means that we check this at constant values of whatever the other two coordinates are, in this case, X and Y. In other words, we just check the dependence on Z and on nothing else. Similarly, this DEZ by DY is checking how the Z component of the field changes as we move along Y and so on and so forth. So why do we care about this? Well, remember the right-hand side of our equation is zero, but importantly, this is a zero vector. We have a vector on this side, so this side is a vector too. The zero vector is simply zero, zero, zero. And this means we can equate each component of the left-hand side with each component of the right-hand side, which then allows us to rearrange each of those equations, and we end up with this set of relations. Let's take a look at the top one. What we see is that for an electric field to exist in a region of space where there isn't a changing magnetic field, the Y component of the electric field must change with respect to Z in the same way or at the same rate that its Z component changes with respect to Y. Similarly, the X component changes with Z at the same rate that the Z component changes with X. And the same is true for the X and Y components. All this to show that in such a scenario, the electric field is a lot more constrained than we think. It has to behave in a very specific way. And we can't just make up components and expect an electric field like that to exist. Even if we were to include changing magnetic fields, that would lift the restrictions slightly, but not so much that any field we can think of 
is allowed to be an electric field. In fact, all that would happen if we had a changing magnetic field is that there's an extra term added onto these equations, but there is still a constraint on how the different components of the electric field are allowed to behave in relation with each other. Now, what's the physical significance of these equations other than the constraint on the electric field? Well, it has to do with potential difference. The same thing that we often associate with electric circuits. The idea is that in an electric field, which is a conservative field, a particle can move around and return to the same place, and it should not have gained or lost energy as a result of this process. A really nice analogy for understanding this is gravitational potential. When I walk around a hill, maybe moving up the hill and down the hill, and then eventually return to the same spot as before, I should not have any more or any less gravitational potential energy than when I was first at that spot, unless the mountains somehow got higher or lower, which is what a changing magnetic field would do to our electric field system. But anyway, that's a whole different topic of discussion for a future video. Let me know if you'd like to see that. Now, before we finish up, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace gives you a beautiful, powerful online platform from which to create your website. You can build a community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. On top of that, you can easily display posts from your social profiles on your website. You can also connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members-only content. You can manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights as well, all on one easy-to-use platform. So if you're looking to very easily create a crisp, nice-looking website, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash path G to get a free trial and to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com forward slash path G. Huge thanks to Squarespace once again for sponsoring this video. And with that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch linked below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Einstein. And finally, I'd like to say a big thanks to my Giga patrons and all of my other patrons over on my Patreon page. That's also linked down below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.